Good afternoon. I'm sitting in my garden to read a composition, The Perennial Season. Sandy Ward deserves my appreciation for creating this opportunity with her determination to make the Nature Creative Writing Contest a success despite the virus pandemic. I am Christy Frenchy. As my essay is titled, my years are full of perennial seasons. I am a professional artist, a sailor who has navigated the Great Lakes, the Erie Canal, the St. Lawrence, Lawrence Seaway, the Hudson River, Long Island Sound, and this took me on a trip from Cleveland to Newport, Rhode Island. And I'm also a gardener. Today, I sit among daylilies and Asian lilies of mid-July. I wrote this piece in early spring, in March of 2020. Life is all about changes. And now I begin reading my composition. The perennial season, habits, the morning routine, automatic behaviors strung like beads on a necklace. This is comfort, there is comfort in this. It begins in a chilly urgency to pull on my bathrobe and slip on my fat furry slippers. Descending the stairs in the darkness of dawn and feeling a muscle ache or a stiffness in my left knee. Adjusting the thermostat, quietly moving onward to the kitchen, making the floor squeak and protest. Measuring water into the coffee pot. Then the final best be bead of all, going outside to wander through the garden. How does everything change so? Yesterday's garden subtly becomes today's. I notice early crocus blooms are done and gone. Trout lilies bloom their yellow trumpets and the graceful pink petals on delicate stems of the spring beauties rule the woodland floor for now. The doppelganger decentra with their lacy leaves appear. The squirrel corn bloom resembles that of the bleeding heart, and the Dutchman's breeches, whose blossoms hang from a stem by their pantaloon legs. I'm impatient with the creeping flocks. Their foliage is sparked by the first flowers of lavender, white, and red. I promise to become a beautiful blanket of blooms. As I ascend the garden steps, I hear wings flapping, sounding like the shaking out of a sopping wet bath towel. It is a wood duck that takes flight from a nearby towering maple tree. At my feet, I'm delighted by the richness of colors and of the small and mighty primroses along my primrose path. The first of the daffodils are fading as the red, redbud tree dons buds, adorning branches and twigs to trace a lovely magenta lace against the sky. So too, the dogwood trees sneak toward exquisiteness as clouds of white and pink, pink blossoms. Retracing my steps, I note that dawn glows in shades of warm pastels as clouds blanketing above promise another sprinkle soon. The bird song grows louder and louder with too many phrases and too many divas competing for attention. A feeder filled with mealworm hangs from a low branch on the dogwood tree at the kitchen window. My visitors include the nuthatch, chickadees, a pair of tufted, tufted titmouse, dark-eyed junco, a downy woodpecker, and bluebirds. Another bird at this feeder is the indomitable house wren who may nest in the wreath at the front door or builds the nest inside the garage and willfully refuses to move out. Out in the grass, a couple of northern flickers search for bugs and robins, and robins listen for worms. I pause when I hear the soothing coo, 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 coo. She repeats the call, and she is my morning dove. Morning, spelled M-O-R-N-I-N-G. Tonight, if she calls, she is my morning dove. Morning is spelled M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And each morning is the same, but different. Time sweeps the seasons through my year. 
Suddenly in this moment I, of reflection, I notice and understand that my life has seasons and years and changes. I tremble and trust less the comfort in my comfortable necklace of habits. Third place in this year's uh, adult, po uh, adult prose contest goes to Christy French for the essay, The Perennial Season. And uh, uh, Christy is, uh, uh, maybe paragraph one's a little bit slow getting to the topic, but once she gets there, she does a tremendous job. And what I like is her fine ability of observation and specificity. And I, I would always tell my students that the specifics makes your writing better, makes your poetry better, makes your prose better. And uh, so she uh, takes us uh, on a tour of the, the spring flowers, the crocus, trout lilies, spring beauties, squirrel corn, bleeding heart, Dutchman breeches, and the flocks. And, uh, and I like how uh, carefully she observes uh, things. She makes a, a little uh, joke uh, later as uh, she uh, observes a wood duck uh, taking flight from uh, a neighboring maple tree. And she says, at my feet I'm delighted by the richness of colors of the small and mighty primroses along my primrose path. So she makes a little language joke there. Uh, later she's talking about the daffodils and the red bud and the dogwood trees. She also uh, observes the bird life around her, the nuthatches, chickadees, tufted titmouse, mice, uh, dark-eyed junco, woody downy woodpecker, the bluebirds, house wrens, the northern flickers, and the robins. And uh, like all of these fine pieces of writing, she wraps it up very nicely at the end. Uh, suddenly in this moment of reflection, I notice and understand that my life has seasons and years and changes. So this is uh, third place and uh, uh, a very nice essay there by uh, Christy French. Hi, my name is Lori Vaught and my piece is called Township Creek Number 3. We ran down the well-groomed path next to the flashy silver guardrails that signaled to vehicles or pedestrians they were about to cross the bridge. No store-bought toy brought as much excitement and joy as Township Creek Number 3, especially on a warm day in the middle of summer. We couldn't get our shoes kicked off fast enough as we were anxious to wade into the sparkling, gently flowing water. Aunt Margaret, who easily had to be about 110 years old, or so my single-digit self thought, would wait patiently on the flowery tree-covered banks as my sister Gina and I explored this natural playground. I had no doubt that this little creek possessed some sort of magic that brought happiness to anyone who visited. Wading around, upturning rocks in search of crawdads was absolutely thrilling. You had to get into the minds of these small crustaceans to figure out which rocks they preferred to hide under. Flat rocks were your best bet, especially the larger ones. Nothing was more exciting than reaching under the water, pulling up the rock and having a crawdad dart from its secure dwelling. If we were quick enough, we would be able to grab it and put it into our little pink bucket. If we missed, it would quickly disappear into the now disturbed murky water. Some days, however, it didn't take us long to gather two or three in our bucket. We would proudly present them to Aunt Margaret, who never seemed too impressed by them and made sure we didn't bring them too close. Although the creek seemed to us a happy, carefree, and enchanted section of the world, there were limitations too. Gina and I knew we could not go too far in each direction or something bad might happen. Wandering downstream in one direction might take us right into the Charlestown sand pit, a place that swallows up little girls. In the other direction was a huge culvert that helped the water flow under the bridge to the other side. A person could easily crawl through it, or if you were small enough, just bend over a bit and walk through it. Our older brother made sure we were too terrified to try that. If you made it to the other side, you have now entered the Ravenna Arsenal, where you would immediately be shot by guards. Needless to say, Gina and I never entertained that idea. The same brother that had us terrified of the Arsenal recently purchased a cottage next to the creek. It's been over 40 years since I've been there and I was elated to go hiking with my brother and check out our old stopping grounds. 
As we set out, my excitement soon turned to dismay. The perfectly mowed path that took us down to the creek was unrecognizable. In fact, there wasn't a path at all. We made our way through briar bushes and tall weeds to a body of water that didn't resemble the magical creek that I had known as a child, as mud and silt had narrowed it considerably. Trees and dead branches had fallen in so many directions, it looked as if it would be impossible to even reach the creek. I instantly had a feeling of sorrow that no child would ever experience the enchantment of what this wondrous place offered so many years ago. I was not only sad for the creek and the way it looked now, but I was also realized I was grieving a wonderful childhood that I would never have again. The old adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same, did not seem to apply to this special creek. As my brother and I hiked the length of the creek that day, I refused to see it in its current state. I just tried to keep up with my brother the best that I could as we balanced along fallen trees and hopped across rocks. It occurred to me that is something that didn't change. I was always just trying to keep up with my brother. After scaling some rugged terrain, we showed up at a tree that my uncle had carved his initials into after returning from the Vietnam War. The stamp hit stopped just short of digging where this majestic tree stood. It warmed my heart to see this tree still standing tall. My brother and I eventually made our way back to the entrance of the creek. I don't think I would wander in barefoot now, but I was close enough to reach the water and flip over a rock. A large crawdag dashed away. Had I been able to catch it, I would have picked it up. That didn't change either. Thank you. Second prize this year in the adult prose contest goes to Lori Vaught for the uh, essay Township Creek Number no. Three. Well, this is uh, it's funny a funny generic name for a creek and. Uh, I actually googled that term and I was not able to find Township Creek number three. I found some other creeks uh, in the area that had names, that had names, <laughs> and uh, um, but that's maybe, that must be what they called it when she was a kid because this is a, a kind of memoir of growing up, and uh, so uh, this is set in uh, Portage County near the Ravenna Artis Arsenal, and. Uh, it's uh, a little kid uh, going down to the creek and uh, with her, I believe it's with her brother, and uh, it, it's uh, funny, uh, she talks about her Aunt Margaret uh, um, sort of watching her and taking her down to the creek. Aunt Margaret's 110 years old, at least that's in, what the, the seven or eight year old little kid thinks. <laughs> Aunt Margaret was really probably about 30. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, she goes down to the creek, and it's, it's a magical place. And uh, it starts to uh, sound a little bit like fairy tale uh, in uh, the, the magic that's in here. Uh, so uh, we, we see them uh, uh, down, going down the path and going into the creek and finding crawdads under the, under the rocks. And uh, uh, in the... Uh, third paragraph she talks about uh, how uh, they knew not to go too far in either direction. If they went too far in one direction, they'd go into the Charlestown sand pit, a place that swallows up little girls. <laughs> and I actually looked, there is a Charlestown uh, sand company uh, right down there uh, in Portage County. And uh, so this must be the area she was talking about. She says, in the other direction was uh, the Ravenna Arsenal, a culvert that went under a road that took you into the Ravenna Arsenal. And, uh, uh, and she was told that she would immediately be shot by guards there. <laughs> so uh, I doubt that that's true, but that in the imagination of a little kid, that's how she thought of it. And that set the boundaries of Charlestown. Uh, sand pit on one side and the Ravenna Arsenal on the other side. Uh, well, she goes back there as an adult many years later, and it's not the same anymore. It's all overgrown, and uh, it just does not seem like the same place that the old magic seems to be gone. And uh, she's uh, mourning for the, the creek that once was and the childhood that once was. Uh, and then uh, she and her brother 
do find an old tree there that they remember that their uncle had carved his initials in after returning from the Vietnam War. And that's still there. And uh, so there's a little bit of, uh, you might say, a little bit of redemption at the end of uh, what otherwise might have been a, a sad essay. So I really love this essay. Very nice. It reminded me, actually, of uh, somebody else who wrote an essay set right near the arsenal, Scott Russell Sanders, a very fine writer, one of America's finest essayists. And uh, this one, he, he would appreciate this one. Hello, nature lovers. My name is Kevin Louise Shaner, and I'm reading my essay to you from my backyard in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Nature is essential. The mornings were noticeably quieter as we sheltered in place this March. A cardinal staccato, get up, get up, drilled into the silence as I felt like he was tapping my shoulder. How many more mornings will I count on him to abruptly encourage me to get out of bed, to cope with the unknown? What will this be like, living alone and isolated I observed a lesson in natural perseverance right out my kitchen window. With a large white oak on the property line, it is no surprise that I have a lot of squirrels. Each morning, my squirrel climbs into the Japanese maple. He purposely heads for the green-capped finch feeder hanging there. He must hope that something mysteriously happened overnight that will allow him to get at those seeds. Nope, no change today. Humans are living like my squirrel. Each day we are hoping for positive outcomes. While Dr. Atkin cautions us about not spreading human droplets, mother nature freely allows hers to fall. Some raindrops are so fat, they look like snow. Oh, they are snow. As the temperatures warm, the result is a small pond in the middle of my lawn. With so much uncertainty, we long for signs of our routine. So in addition to my squirrel buddy, oh, here they come, four does confidently stride up my driveway no observance of six feet distancing from them and not even from me when I happen to be outside when they slosh through the water, which must seem like Euclid Creek. Nothing is more normal in the heights than to have deer in your backyard. Health professionals encourage us to get outside. Strolling through my own neighborhood, I nod to neighbors and not all of them are walking a dog. I am praying for those in hospitals to be able to take a deep breath of fresh air. Don't you love how the fragrance of hyacinths is like an expensive perfume? Pink and white cones from potted plants bloom under my front window. They were brought home and transplanted after the Easter service last year. Sadly, churches are now closed. Appreciating hyacinths daily gives me hope that next year open sanctuaries will be filled with people and flowers. I left my 95 year old dad a purple hyacinth at his nursing home. It has been weeks since I have seen him, but I can look forward to planting this flower in my yard when I can. Unlike the hyacinths, my daffodils appear to be stunted, a feeling shared by many. Initially, the shoots survived the snow, grew seven inch stems, and yellow buds were promising. And then nothing more happened. Finally, I cut the four stems, brought them inside and placed them into a vase of warm water. Turns out they just needed a little help to thrive and survive, just like a lot of humans right now. Surprise, the centers were smiling sunburst orange. 
not all daffodils needed a boost this April. 100,000 bloomed at Lakeview Cemetery. Wow. A positive number in contrast with the data that we dread hourly on CNN. With our No Place Like Home daily reminder, the daffodil carpet reminded me of Dorothy's yellow brick road. The trumpet shaped flowers are individuals like we are in our homes, but the beauty of them collectively emphasize that something positive will come of our being in this together. When I return home, I gently touch the fresh red buds on my maple. Surprisingly, this gesture takes me back to a longing to caress my grandson's head. It has been over a month since I have touched a human or been touched by one. Without experiencing hugs from others, I have appreciated Mother Nature's embrace. While reflecting on this time of distancing, some homely morning doves make me smile. These ground feeders are cooing and courting each other. Did you know they mate for life? Many human partners are separated right now. I know of a couple married for 66 years who have COVID-19. I can imagine their longing to express their lifelong love with a hug. April is almost over. The pandemic is not. We continue to shelter in place. We have witnessed good will come in spite of it. Flowering for Scythia, weeping cherries, and big petal pink magnolias. Spring is at her peak and we wait for the virus to do the same. Essentially, nature has inspired, comforted, and embraced us. Thank goodness our weeks of stoppage happen now while we have nature to move us forward. Daylilies are sprouting by my garage. I hope the deer leave me a few. Orange and yellow flowers in June will remind us that like them, we can live one day at a time. And yes, the deer did leave me a few day lilies and the final one bloomed last week. I would also like to thank Sandy Ward for all of her efforts to make the nature contest possible. Thank you. In the adult prose category, the first prize goes to Kevin Louise Shainer for Nature is Essential. And uh, this is uh, a short essay that, uh, that uh, is set in the natural world and then uh, reflects on the strange world that we human beings have entered since March uh, with the coronavirus and uh, uh, the isolation that people are feeling and are forced to experience. Uh, uh, like a lot of these uh, very fine pieces of writing, she uh, grabs, us, grabs our attention early on in the second sentence, a cardinal staccato, get up, get up, drilled into the silence. And I felt like he was tapping on my shoulder. So uh, she brings in, in these birds with beautiful word choice and, uh, and then uh, she opens it up to reflecting on what all this means. She talks about uh, a lesson in natural perseverance uh, that she's learning from uh, the birds and the squirrels outside her window. Uh, she uh, actually brings in Dr. Acton in the poem and talks about how uh, Mother Nature uh, is doing sort of the opposite of what Dr. Acton's encouraging us to do with masks and uh, social distancing. And she says, Mother Nature freely allows her droplets to fall. And uh, she thinks about, uh, later in the essay, about the people in hospitals who are unable to take a deep breath of fresh air. And, uh, and then she uh, goes on to think about her own breathing in her garden of the, uh, the scent of hyacinths 
and uh, the plants uh, that they planted uh, uh, around Easter time, uh, I guess they would be Easter lilies and uh, uh, she, she thinks about her 95 year old father in a nursing home who she's unable to see, hasn't been able to see for weeks and all the other people in the nursing homes like him. Uh, uh, she thinks about her grandson who she's been unable to hug and, uh, uh, and toward the end uh, the lesson that she gets from Mother Nature is that we can only live one day at a time. So uh, this is uh, Nature is Essential first prize to Kevin Louise Shainer. Hello, my name is Laura Reed and my poem is entitled Full Eclosure. Caterpillar contemplated in chrysalis confined. Imaginal cells imagined well, though in dark prison cell no sun shined. Wondering, waiting, wishing, waiting, wondering, wishing, waiting, waiting. Till wondrous day, wall wasted away, light of day, fear held at bay. Push, press, against duress, compressed, stressed, still pressed, till flutter, flutter, butterfly, freedom finally found. Wonderful, wishful wings whisked away. Wonder-filled wishes abound. Another honorable mention goes to Laura Reed for her poem, Full Eclosure. Again, the word eclosure is a little bit different. Uh, I had me, again, scrambling to a dictionary. I can under, I know enclosure, and uh, uh, inclusive and exclusive, but uh, eclosure is uh, a little bit different and uh, this poem is about partly about uh, a caterpillar uh, becoming a butterfly it uses a really nice word choice and a lot of alliteration like a middle stanza wondering waiting wishing waiting wondering wishing waiting waiting I always like the uh, the judicious use of repetition and uh, I, I, I do like alliteration used correctly, used well. Uh, the poem has very nice rhythms and uh, and uh, at the end where the butterfly emerges and uh, till flutter, flutter, butterfly, freedom finally found, wonderful wishful wings whisked away, wonder filled wishes abound. So that's an honorable mention that Fully Closure by Laura Reed. Hi, I'm Sarah Marcus Donnelly, and this is my poem, Revival, Revival. Revival, Revival. Five years of without, a resurrection plants dead limbs reaching for rain, canticle of branches. To be killed so many times by the sun, lament passes, the desert belongs. Bone people walking the singing sand dunes, waves without water, dreams lost to us. Unspell me. My heartland heartbeats back to the bone lick several mistakes ago. A cowgirl's salt wound slit by early beasts lured to that lusty sanctuary of self-discovery. Even my hair remembers what your body felt like. A felled forest still tethered to the moon. An honorable, honorable mention in the poetry contest is Revival, Revival by Sarah Marcus Donnelly. And uh, when I reread this poem, it struck me how close uh, honorable mention is to the top prizes. This is a very good poem. Uh, it's uh, um, a poem that connects, uh, like all the poems did really, one's experience with nature with one's own life. and. Uh, she again grabbed me by the very first line, which is uh, bone people walking the singing sand dunes, and it goes on. And uh, this image of bone is uh, uh, repeated later in the poem in the middle. Unspell me, my heartland, 
heart beats back by the bone lick uh, and uh, so it's, it's nice how she she reiterates that image later in the poem and then toward the end of the poem it uh, it connects to her own personal experience at least that's what we guess the imagined experience and uh, the poem ends like this even my hair remembers what your body felt like a felled forest still tethered to the moon so really a fine ending to a very good poem so that's an honorable mention revival revival by Sarah Marcus Donnelly Jolted up by grasshoppers tasing the air. A familiar stranger being refracted by dragonfly's eyes. My backpack replacing the weight I've lost and trekking poles fending off the spider's webs trying to glue me down. There is no food for thought or thoughts creating food. Only the shackling of boots consuming the next 15 miles. My mouth swan dives into obscenities and prayer. Why does every mosquito believe me typo? The carcass of my eroded brain begins to be hollowed out by the gnashing of woodpeckers' beaks. In this 101-mile wilderness, this is my supper fest. Approaching a sign, I do not excite. Yet another measurement of pain. Each hand, like antlers, slam on the post. Only six miles to go. Marching to the beat of a hummingbird, I need that sweet nectar. Those words hollowing in unison with melding carnivore shadows. Twilight dawns. My eyes lick passing hikers' fingers clean and lips for compassion. Snarling glances of humans remain the top of the food chain. Insects and rodents skitter beneath my laces. The motion of starvation rings their dinner bell. My last wish of compassion to those as hungry as me. With my body conducting the decomposers prepare a symphony. Alas, dissonance is heard as my rack of hair battle signage. I've made it, when to go. Third place in the poetry contest this year is a poem called Sufferfest by Ben Feckety. Well, the, the title is odd, putting suffer and fest together, and uh, uh, you wonder about that until you start reading the poem. And the poem is about uh, a long, long hike. And uh, I, had, I had to do uh, some searching on Google for some of the terminology, like 101-mile wilderness. Well, I found it's a, a section of the Northern Appalachian Trail. And it sounds like a long hike, a long, difficult hike. And uh, the, the hiker does take us through this struggle, this, through the final part of this hike. And uh, I uh, really like the opening line, poets and all writers need to pay great attention to the way poems or stories or essays begin. And this begins, jolted up by grasshoppers tasing the air. Now that's, that line grabbed me and struck me and kept me reading. And uh, <clears throat> so the poet takes us uh, through, through the poem and the suffer fest until uh, finally uh, very hungry and very thirsty and feeling almost half dead uh, arrives at the, at the end a place called Windigo which I, I still need to look that up what is Windigo exactly but it must be the destination uh, and uh, this poem reminded me a little bit of um, my daughter who lives in Montana and works in wildernesses and in national parks and uh, uh, I've uh, hiked a little bit with her, and I understand the feeling that Ben Feckety uh, is expressing in this really nice poem. So, Sufferfest by Ben Feckety is third prize. Hi, my name's Christina Mihalik, and I'm here to read my poem, Bird in the Hand. I waited, hand outstretched to your version of heaven. Chickadee, steal this seed. Hear the other birds sing, I dare you. Stand and shake, muscle fatigue. This dull, cold quiet of winter reminds me, I am human. And that moment you land, only briefly, yet just long enough to sense a trust in nature. This sliver in a moment I call hope living, a 
scratch in the palm, toes like needles on skin. Second place this year in the poetry contest is the poem Bird in the Hand by Christina Mihalik. This is a short poem, but I really liked it, and I love the way it ended with a, with its bu a beautiful image. Uh, this is about the interaction of a human being and a chickadee. Uh, the human being is holding out her hand with seed on it, and the chickadee lands in her hand, and uh, uh, it leads to this sudden insight, I'm human, and, <laughs> and this bird is on my hand. And uh, uh, I would like just to uh, read a little bit of the end of the poem so you can see the image that this ends on. Uh, I'm human. In the moment you land, only briefly, yet just long enough to sense a trust in nature, this sliver in a moment I call hope living, a scratch in the palm, toes like needles on the skin. So this was second place this year, Bird in the Hand by Christina Mihalik, very fine poem. Hello, my name is Hallie Blados, and this is my poem, A Corvidae Contest. Once again, a daily sport, the Blue Jays run a relay on the wing. Feeder, tree, feeder, tree, a race of greed, a race to see who can gather up the peanuts that my mother scatters like Easter eggs every morning. But as I watch, a new challenger, a new name comes to interrupt the game, my favorite competitor of them all. He lights down, dark like a shadow, sleek like a fighter jet. But no, not a fighter, not that I've seen yet. A coward most days, but today, just hungry. The jays whiz past, they whine from the trees, once wheedling for more peanuts, now warning the newcomer who eyes their prize. He takes it all in, stately like a statue, not shaken by his distant cousin's empty jeering, and in timely fashion flicks his wings, content with his descent and waddles, bumbles, stumbles around on the uneven grass like a debutante's first time in stilettos, making a roundabout the theater, a wide berth, needing to get a grasp on the stakes before making his play. There on the ground, fumbled by someone, one large and lonely peanut, lost in the race of the relay on the wing. The jays move too fast to see it, but his eyes are keen, keen to see the nut, the jays, me, behind the window screen, a clever strategist or a coward weighing his odds. It's all the same. No contest from the Jays, and certainly not from me. He knows, goes forward with that waddling strut, picks up the nut, watches his cousins and me, the spectators, and gives another flick of the wing, too humble a crow to be crowing over his victory, yet still pleased with his performance, and takes off to interrupt someone else's backyard contest. Only a moment passes before the race resumes, a brief admiration before the Jays return to their relay on the wing, and I return to my busy morning, reminded to pause for breakfast and the little things I often miss by racing too fast. Thank you. The winner of this year's adult category uh, poetry in the Geauga Park's nature writing contest is called A Corvide Contest by Hallie Blados. Well, this uh, poem had me scrambling to the dictionary to find out what Corvide was, and I discovered it's uh, uh, the class of birds that includes crows and blue jays and magpies and things like that. And uh, uh, so, uh, as I start reading the poem, I really uh, enjoyed the use of uh, the line breaks the, the poet used, and also some of the word choice and the alliteration. For, for example, here's a stanza. The jays whiz past, they whine from the trees, once wheedling for more peanuts, now warning the newcomer who eyes their prize. Uh, and it goes on a little further. The, uh, the bird waddles, bumbles, stumbles around on the uneven grass like a debutante's first time in stilettos. So there's both uh, a beautiful simile, really nice verbs, and nice sounds uh, that the poet uses. Well, this is a, a dramatic poem. The, the drama is between a crow and a blue jay that are scrambling after a peanut at a bird feeder. And uh, <clears throat> toward the end, uh, the poet uh, 
thinks about herself as uh, a spectator, as an observer of this action. And the poem goes, uh, uh, the bird watches his cousins and me, the spectators, and gives another flick of the wing, too humble a crow to be crowing over his victory, and yet still pleased with his performance. So there's a really nice little uh, turn there, using the noun crow and the verb crowing. And at the end, uh, the poet uh, takes all this in and tries to bring it back to her own life. And uh, uh, the last two lines are reminded to pause for breakfast and the little things I often miss by racing too fast. So that's uh, the winner this year, a Corvy Day contest by Hallie Blados.